Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Quibell, known to my friends as Marv, and this time I'm speaking with Paul Bavill from the podcast History Rage. Hey Paul, thanks for speaking with me today. You're welcome, how are you doing? I'm okay, thank you. How's things with you? Exhausting, but rewarding. Yes, the life of a podcaster. Yeah. Yeah, especially the life of a podcaster who's building up this week to be at a major history festival, so I've got all that to do as well. Right, right. Let's get on with it. So how did your interest in history start? Because I do know that you, you, did you study history at school as well? Only so far I was, I, I've got zero academic credentials at all, okay. completely none. I don't even have the history GCSE because when I was at school, I was basically told, don't take the history GCSE because you will almost certainly fail it. Yeah. A fact that I now come back to my history teacher and go, look at me doing this history podcast. But I think on the whole, they were right. I don't want to be unfair to him. It was right because I, it wasn't presented in a very interesting way for me at school at all. I had a history teacher that managed to make the Wars of the Roses dull. The Wars of the Roses. It's Game of Thrones without the dragons. How yep. the hell do you make that dull? But they managed. And so I wasn't really that engaged with it. And it was, it was really, it was leaving school. Yep. That sparked an interest in history. Um, I'd read a few things. I was quite interested in battles. That's what got me interested in history in the first place when I was way younger. It's like my first history teacher. The first term was Battle of Ashencourt, Battle of Hastings, Battle of Bosworth. How else would you get a classroom, classroom full of eight-year-old boys interested in history other than going down that route? And I was in, and I was hooked. But the trouble is, once we got past that term, it just all became then... 17th century crop rotating techniques and who invented the spinning jenny the rotating mildred the oscillated deirdre and all that sort of thing and i just completely lost interest so once i got out of school and i could pick and choose the history that i wanted to get into yeah then that uh, that basically just opened up my world so that was oh god i dread to think how long ago that was now it was over 30 years ago but I've been kind of passionately following history, sometimes quite passively. I will I will stick the TV on in an evening and just see what history documentary is on, and I will learn about that. There was there was an awkward moment when my wife came home to find me in PB, PBS America's three part documentary on the life of the Ku Klux Klan. That okay. was on, and I thought, well, I'll give that I'll give that a whirl and see how that goes. So yeah, that's that that's the potted history of me in history, and then sort of go got from there into reenactment and into living history about yeah. 20 years ago it's actually where i met my wife and then from there it's really just evolved into video work podcasting historical talks and so forth but i'm thinking of doing the history gcse but i am debating with myself about whether or not i just wear this lack of qualification as a badge of pride you, you make me think there of myself with my english and because I left, I left school intending to do GCSEs, but I'm not going to go into why I didn't stay mm -hmm. on and do those. But I've always thought, oh God, I wish I'd, I wish I'd have actually gone back and done those and done those in a way, the English and the maths, because it would have been a good thing to fall back on and do other things as well that I was studying at school that I could have done qualifications in. It's, it's all that. But now at 53, I'm thinking, is it too late for me to actually do something about that? Yeah, yeah. People keep saying to me, oh, Paul, go and get a history degree. It would cost a minimum £18,000 to yeah. get a history degree. And I'm thinking, in what way does it advance my career at all? I, I have a career in law, up yep. to a point. A history degree is not going to advance that further. I could do a history degree for for the simple sake of doing a history degree, but I am a Yorkshireman and spending £18,000 on something, I have an allergic reaction to that. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And you, you all are oh, talking about Yorkshiremen, that reminds me of what, what you said in the introduction where you were talking about Wars of the Roses. 
there is an episode all about the Wars of the Roses, which isn't Yorkshire versus Lancashire. It's much more than that. Oh, it's, it's in, in fact, York, Lancastrian stronghold for broadly yeah. most of it. I live about three miles away from Pontefract Castle. It's like okay. the, the key to the north. It, it is it's the power base of the House of Lancaster. If you're going to pick a geology geological, if you're going to pick a geographical kind of divide over that, then it becomes very much north and south with the Lancaster and the House of Lancaster being based firmly up in the north and the majority of the House of York being based firmly in the south. It becomes a good old fight against southerners. But yeah, yeah, we'll get into that as well because into that uh, others as well because there's two others that jumped out at me. In fact, we could get onto one of them now. You got me into it now. So another episode that 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 hooked me was when you were talking about the as they were named the dad's army that situation there because my granddad was actually in 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 those because he he worked down in the mines mm-hmm. and he was also doing that as well at the same time on the home front or whatever and so he he was say, he, I, I remember it quite vividly that he. He liked the television show Dad's Heart, Dad's Army. He enjoyed it, mm. but he always made a point to me to say, it's fun, but it was so much more than that. That's not how it was. Yeah. And they weren't people who were useless, didn't know what they were doing. They were actually really well trained in multiple armed force techniques and things, so they knew what they were doing. Yeah, if you if you look at the Home Guard, you've got you've got those two distinct kind of like groups that that Dad's Army portrays. You've got the old timers like your Frasers and your Godfreys and your, your your Sergeant Wilsons, and then you've got your kind of younger ones, your your Private Pikes and so forth. You've people in reserved occupations. And the thing about those old timers, yeah, they fought the First World War. Yeah. You, you've got a very patriotic group of people right there with combat experience, yeah. recent combat experience. They know what they're doing. You've got a platoon there full of people who can train your private pikes yeah. as to as to what they are doing. My my grandfather himself as well, my granddad Brown, he was he was also a home guard. He was yeah. now an air, aircraft engineer at Avro, so reserved occupation. Yeah. He went and joined the home guard. He was the only one out of his entire family that didn't go and fight abroad. Yep. And his mother very much treated him like Private Pike as well. She was the He was the one that she'd still got. <laughs> yeah. And he was about 21 years old. And so she, was, she wasn't letting him out of her sight, basically. But, yeah, he's got the, the Home Guard. I think, I do actually think, I'm going to nail my colours to the mast here, had yep. there been an actual invasion, I think the Home Guard would have been made a remarkable job of, if not stopping it, really making it difficult. Yeah. They'd have made a dent on on them coming in. Uh, Very much so. Bear in mind, there would have been a pretty knackered army by the time that they got past the British army. Because if we're, we're waiting for invasion, that's because we've just pulled the British army out of Dunkirk. The British army is sitting in England, which is a train ride away from total mobilization. Yeah. If they if they land, they're facing everything that is left of the British Army, which is quite a lot when you're on home soil. Plus, you've got to get past the Navy. Plus, you've got to get past the Air Force. Once you do that, you find that the Home Guard are not going to give you an easy ride. But, you know, we're going there now, so I might as well go with the other one as well. So the show is basically about things that have happened in history but are perceived or portrayed incorrectly in whatever way, in either history lessons or in media or any other way at all. Mm -hmm. And it's to sort of push across the reality and say that in some cases, because I'm going to mention this one as well, in some cases, like Braveheart, the film, for instance, it's acknowledged that Braveheart is a good film, but it's a film. And it is fiction for the most part. And... But that doesn't stop it from being a good film, much as there's a lot of Westerns that are good films, but historically incorrect. And that's the that's the old thing where people need to be able to know where to separate and understand that, yep, these films are there, or this media is there, but it's done in such a way where it's 
creative and people have used, call it poetic license or call mm. it whatever you want, but you've got to realise that no film, for the most part, and no book, and no novelization of a story is 100% the truth. No, but the thing with Braveheart, which is why I kind of went with that episode, yep. is had Braveheart just left it at that, I probably would have just left it alone. Mm-hmm. After all, I'm not a rivet counter, and you talk to you talk to any medievalist, and I will lay my next salary that any medievalist's favourite film is A Knight's Tale. Okay. There's not an authentic thing in it. Any no. World War II nut that you can pick out of a hat is going to love Where Eagles Dare. How could you not? Yeah. Yeah. But Braveheart opens up by basically claiming that that's true. Yeah. And that history has been written differently. It's always, yeah, the history is written by the people who hanged heroes, and then it goes on to all this stuff. Now, at that point, if you're claiming it's history, I expect you to have made the effort. Yeah. And there's the thing. It just didn't make the effort. They shoehorn in this entire romance between William Wallace and Isabella of France. Isabella of France can't gloss over the fact that she was eight years old at the time. Yep. And she didn't actually turn up in England until three years after Wallace was executed. That's a pretty, that's not just an inaccuracy, that's a blatant invention. Yep. And if you're going to invent, fine, you can do that. Again, one of my favourite films, Plunkett and McClay. As far as the golden age of highwaymen goes, it's in completely the wrong year. They escape into a Victorian sewer system that is, even by the setting of the film, not around for another 200 years. But I don't mind. It is an absolute classic film. I was fabulous and it was a bloody good laugh and so forth. But Braveheart opens up by that claim of of history. We did a similar thing with with Zach White, who is one of my repeat ragers. He keeps coming back for other episodes with me. He's the chairman of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves charity. And and he literally phoned me from outside the cinema when he'd come out from the Napoleon film. And he just said, I need to do an episode of this right yeah. now. Because of mostly because of Ridley Scott's like retort to Dan Snow, where he went, Were you there? It's no, but we do know where to find all the words of people who were. And it was it's that I'm not gonna sit here and say it's oh, like people are too thick to pick up a book and things like that. But if you are claiming that that is history, do the history. You don't have to be a documentary. You don't have to look at James Cameron's Titanic, one that I rage about quite, quite frequently. It's like you don't need to shoehorn additional stories into this. The Titanic disaster is dramatic enough. Thank you very much. You are playing with real people and you're playing with real people's lives. And some of those people died. And you you owe it to them to to make the effort. You you, You watch a war film like A Bridge Too Far. It's not a documentary of Operation Market Garden. No. But it does a bloody good job of making you think about Market Garden. Actually, actually, it's funny you should mention that film, A Bridge Too Far, because my late stepfather, his, there is a portrayal of somebody, there is somebody in A Bridge Too Far that's portraying his own father in there. So that was always something that that I was always mindful of was the mm-hmm. fact all I remember is him saying to me oh that's 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 my dad being portrayed there as so it's something that I thought oh that's always something that pulled me to that film in a sense and the closeness to reality even though like I said it's not 100% but it does yeah. a bloody good job of like you said getting people to look at that if you want to go into go into go down the rabbit hole and find out more mm. Yeah, one of the things that I, w- I will rage about is the portrayal of Henry Hook in Zulu. Uh, that, that is an absolute disservice to a VC winner. Right there, to paint him as this work shy, lazy, alcoholic, when Henry Hook won a Victoria Cross yeah. and was a teetotaler. And he, he, why, why destroy characters? It's the same in Titanic when First Officer Murdoch kind of shoots somebody and then shoots himself. Cameron yeah. ended up having to pay £5,000 to a school in Dalkeith that's that's in Murdoch's name yeah. in order to write that reputation. And this is the that's where I kind of get ragey with media. If let, let's see, so let's see if you know about this one. If you want, I'm going to give someone a sp- people an, an idea of something to watch. If you can find it, there's a mini series from the 1980s talking about Zulu that I really, really enjoyed, which was Shaka Zulu, which was about 
the leader of the original Zulus have got all the tribes together. And I find that a fascinating miniseries. It's got some bits, I think, where they've played around with the story in some ways. Mm -hmm. But I think because of the fact that they're looking at it, for the most part, from their point of view, or it's looking from both points of view, actually, that's why I find it interesting is because it's more of a rounded story that's that's saying, right, this is how it looks to the actual Zulus and the, the Africans themselves, and this is how it is to the people who are essentially invading Africa, in a sense. So that miniseries, I think, is a good good show of what happened over there. Yeah, there was one that I always refer to, which is just one of, which I think does it perfectly in terms of getting people interested. And again, you talk about like series in, and we're both of a generation where we remember the classic logo of London weekend television coming up on a we Saturday do. and you are yeah. sitting down, you're in yeah. for a good night at that point. Yeah. And it was LWT's Wish Me Luck. Yes. Wish Me Luck yeah. got me interested in SOE. Yeah. Got me interested in the women of SOE. I'd not heard about that before. And I'd seen, yeah, it's a television drama. It's yeah. got a bit of like romance melodrama in it and stuff like that. It's got yeah. some tension. And it is amalgamating quite a lot of characters who were in who, who were in SOE. But that was the first time I'd heard about it because I don't even think it had been declassified at that point because they weren't even allowed to call it special operations executive. Yeah. But it made me then start going and following those rabbit holes. Yeah. And and if you've not seen it, there's three series of it. It's quite 80s in terms yeah. of its production values, but you will enjoy it. And it, I think it's a really good job as well without without kind of spoon feeding it to the audience. That yeah. They painted the French Resistance for exactly who the French Resistance were. The French Resistance were a bunch of angry communists who could barely get on with each other. Yeah. And that that's what the resistance was portrayed in that in that series and the struggles that they got to try and get these people to work as any sort of similar unit were, yeah. was really well done without actually saying kind of this is what the French resistance are really like. We're trying to be realistic here, but they just they just did it and got on with it and didn't mention it. It's really, really good. Yeah. What else am I thinking of as well? One that got me with that one was a film that I've always enjoyed. And that got me to look up history a bit more as well, which was, oh, the, the Sean Connery film, The Hill, from the 1960s. Was it 1964? I think he made oh, it before between... my time. <laughs> I know it's before my time. I've seen it on television since, and I actually own it on DVD as well. So I think it was 1964, just after he'd finished making Goldfinger, because he had a, he, he made this... They made this deal, I think, where where they made this deal where they'd be like, you do a Bond film, then you do another film that's not Bond and come back to Bond mm -hmm. at this point. So it was one of those. And in The Hill, he's actually a prisoner because he's committed a crime while being in the armed forces against one of the officers or something. I think he hit an officer or something or, or really badly and the, the, the officer ended up in hospital. So he ended up being imprisoned in a prison for criminals that are from the armed forces. And I thought, when I was younger and I first saw it as a kid on television, much too young to watch the film, really. And I saw it on the television and I thought, that's interesting. And then over the years, I thought about it. And then I looked into it and realised that, yeah, we did actually have prisons or places that were made up as prisons that were built by us and we actually imprisoned our own soldiers for crimes that they committed and it's that sort of that sort of thing where i think that's great about these sort of films or television where it's it's not a real story as such but it shows you that these things did happen that you might not have actually have known until mm -hmm. you saw them in in media yeah and that was kind of a thing that sort of thing was kind of a spark of how i started the podcast yeah uh, generally i started the podcast quite accidentally okay i'd been at some history festivals and myself and my former co-host had decided what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a bit of video work so I kind of expand from just doing talks and things like that and just like get into video work and i'm thinking what the hell can i do a video about we found ourselves at the chalk valley history festival or chalk history festival it's now known yeah and i latched onto the idea of i know one or two speakers 
So I'll grab hold of them and see if they'll recommend anybody else to me. And then I just, I kind of just asked the question, the first one to set the camera rolling. And then I just said, what has become the podcast main question now, which is yeah. what is the one historical fact you wish everyone would just stop believing? Yeah. And off they went. Now, the first one was a young lady called Olivia Smith. And she came in to, she came in to talk about the idea of the world war one is not just trenches and charging over the top and waiting to die. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very, very different kind of war. And then, then we got we got Guy Walters, who the great escape is not that great. He doesn't consider it to have been a particularly good idea. I'm inclined to agree with him. And then went from from then. We spent the sort of five days at the festival just gathering those videos together. We did manage to get Dan Snow on that one on Vikings don't have horned helmets. Brilliant. And and I came away and thought that's that that seems to have worked. That will that will carry some traction. And then I remembered that I live in West Yorkshire and most of the history community lives in the southeast of England and southwest of England. And I thought, I can't do videos like this regularly. Yeah. But what I could do is podcasts. And and we can go into more detail. And so I spent about a month or so kind of desperately trying to get hold of guests because I, I, knew, I knew two people. Yeah. I honestly thought this podcast would last until about halfway through series two by the time I'd run out of people that I knew. But by that time, it had got enough traction that other people were getting to hear about it and things like that. So we started out and our first first rage that was done was, was the lady who I consider to have the greatest job title I've ever interviewed, which is Conservator of Human Remains for the Surgeon's Hall Museum in Edinburgh. Yes. And she came with a pet rage of mine, which is that Burke and Hare are not body snatchers. Yes. Serial killers, yes. Body snatchers, definitely not. They never stole a body in their career. And she came on and do, did a uh, did an episode with us. I'd recommend it, but also I'd like to throw a caveat out there. Anybody who's thinking of listening to it, it was my first one. It's probably the worst sound editing I've done in my entire career. You, you may have had that but, yourself when you, somebody comes I, in and goes, oh, I'll listen yeah. to that. I'll, I'll go and listen to the rest of them. And then they go back to episode one and hear the worst podcast episode you've ever recorded and start yeah. from there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that first episode, it, it can be difficult. I have heard it. I, I, but the fact is that if you can get past the sound issues of that first episode, it's the content therein. Mm. If you can get past that sound thing, the content therein is fantastic. The chat between you, it, 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 it's, it's riveting to listen to. Yeah, she's, I went up to actually visit her at the museum after we'd done the recording as well. And if you if you ever get the chance for a guided tour by somebody who works at the museum, always take them up on that because she was taking me all through. And if you've ever been to the Surgeon Hall Museum, it's basically it's like it's like several giant rooms full of body parts. Uh, and to get a guided tour of that on her with what happened to that person. And then she then she took me to a she took me to the conservation lab which is just a necromancer's lair it really is and then on to actually the building where burke and Hare brought the bodies where robert knox worked fascinating stuff but yeah it started from there i think i'd set up about four from people that i knew and then i was just about starting working my way through sort of editing episode two when i got my first request from somebody who wanted to do a rage and it came via Twitter and, and I thought, okay. And I, I hadn't heard of this chap, but it turned out he was, he, he was quite a kind of documentary producer yeah. over in America. And then he came and said, I, I really want to rage that the, the battle of Britain is so the battle of bulge yes. was not just snow and artillery. And, and so it was off from there and I got a couple of booked in and then, and then I, I managed to score a couple of wins then by for the end of my first series, getting Helen Fry, who's quite a big lead. Yeah intelligence historian and then james holland who's one of the biggest world war ii historians out there i'd known him from the festival so i managed to get him and that kind of gave gave me a boost so it's like that first episode i talked about seriously 16 downloads in a week wow that, that, that was it well, and then it starts getting small to, and it gets bigger from there yeah it, it, it absolutely does but i was thinking by the time i'm recording episode eight thinking you know, just listening to this, and and then it's then it's picked up, and I've I've learned a lot of lessons since then. Like you say, once you can get past the sound issues, I do keep whenever I get time. I was like, I will go back and I will just re-edit an old episode, yeah, 
to make sure that I've got the the best sound that I can do. But I've currently got 136 episodes. Yeah. Not all of them are out yet. So I'm all on editing them. The levelator might do 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 the world a good with that first episode. Just leveling the leveling it so that the volumes are yeah. at a good level together, and then you have it at a cap where it's got a good height level so people can hear it really mm-hmm. well, and both voices are then at the same level all the way through. Yeah, I've since I did that, I've learned a lot about equalizing volume levels, getting rid of reverb, all that sort of stuff that that comes along from spending. A, all your time podcasting, and B, when you're not podcasting, spending all of your time watching YouTube videos about podcasting or attending various podcast groups where you can ask questions and so forth. I have basically two modes in life, which is podcast stuff and day job, and pretty much then out there. I mean, I'm assuming a lot of people that are listening to this either like podcasts, but there may be some people out there that are interested in starting one. I would say, yeah, do so. It's a lot of fun, but it is not a hobby. It is a lifestyle choice. And it's used, it starts out as a second job that you pay to do. Yeah, you pay to this and get very, yeah. you, you don't get financially reimbursed initially. If you're yeah, lucky, initially. You, might get, you might get some money eventually. But yeah, History Race Now does. Yeah. We've got, I've grown from where I started. And over the course of that, I've, over the course of that, I lost a co-host because Kyle, eventually by about Series 9, he's got a big project involving Greece and the Second World War that he's actually yeah. wanting to write a book on. So it did come to a point where we just sat and had a chat and he said, something's got to give if I'm going to do this project and I can't give up my day job. I don't want to give up the Living History Group. So I stepped back from the podcast and said, like, that's fine. It's in- absolutely can because I can carry on. Because to be fair, I was doing most of the editing work and things like that in the background sort of work that, that that involved so so that was fine we, we kind of split from that i got better at editing about a year ago two years ago i decided to put it out there on patreon yeah see if anybody fancied that so i gave out like episodes three months early yeah if you if you join up and after your fifth month you get you get your very own history rage mug yeah, Working, with, yeah. Uh, with a rage of your choice on the back of it. And I've developed that a little further. So you've got like ad-free listening because I hit a point then where ACAS said the marketplace is open to you. So it does now make a profit because yeah. one of the beauties of podcasts is not expensive. Yeah. You you just have to pay to do it. But for the amount of money that I pay, I think something like about, I pay about $14 a month for Riverside. I pay about, I would say $29 a month for social champ that allows me to do all the social media stuff. And I pay about $12 a month for ACAST. So you're probably looking at somewhere in the region of about, it costs me about 50 pound a month. It does now make that back. Okay. Uh, and, And more. So it's broadly, it's free to do it. I'm not putting myself down for an Aston Martin quite yet. Mm-hmm. but that's steadily increasing. Like everything else with podcasts, your listeners go up, your subscribers go up, then people like what you do. People will then, they won't throw money at you, but if you say, is £5 a month too much to ask? Some people will say, no, that's fine, and and they do. For all the bells and whistles that I put in there, when I polled my Patreon subscribers and said, why do you give me money? And they just said, oh, I just want to support the show because I enjoy it. If you have one wants- member that turned up for the mug. I was going to say, if anyone wants to forward us the money by PayPal for an, for, for an Aston Martin each, we'll give you the our email addresses later on. Yeah, I would definitely give you a History Rage mug for that as well. Might even give you two of them. Thanks. Yeah, they're £109,000 for a DB9. There you go, people. A lot of Patreon. Yeah, both that we've got, you can monetize it in a number of ways. So you got Patreon's the obvious one, and then, uh, then the ads coming through Acast, which nobody's complained about. So I've got got the right amount of them in there. And then we do things like I've got Amazon affiliate program. That was like, I've interviewed an author. If you want to buy that book, knock yourself out. I'll get a 20% commission on the sale of that book. And that applies to audio books, Kindle and stuff. So that takes up, I've got a merch store where if you're not giving me money, but you still want the mug, you could buy the mug. 
as well as my best-selling items, which is the Princes in the Tower range of T-shirts, because we have one that's basically Henry did it, Richard did it, Margaret Beaufort did it, Buckingham did it, or nobody did it. They've, they've actually sold quite well, especially when I let the Richard III Society know that they were there. The only time when I think ads can be irritating is, to me, because it's a big subject at the moment, that actually, mm. which is... I listened to an episode of a show recently, and it's only a small bite-sized show. And so initially, before it started playing, it came was five minutes. And then when it had actually started playing, it went from five to 13, because eight minutes were adverts. So you had four minutes either side of adverts of the actual programme. And that is probably where it gets irritating, because you think, yeah, this episode's five minutes total. And then, oh, this may, this, no, it's eight, 13 minutes with eight minutes of adverts. Yeah. Minute and a half tops, I would say, is, yeah. is where to go there before you lose people. I mean, the one that annoys me on that, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I haven't gone down the route of like sponsorships or anything like that. Yeah. I was saying, I'm thinking about it, but I haven't gone down that route yet. Is for me, there is nothing more annoying than listening through a minute and a half of adverts, which can be a little bit annoying, but as a podcaster, I kind of feel for other podcasters, so I'll sit and listen to the adverts. But then you you get then the like the host read sponsorship at the start, and then they interrupt it in the middle for another host read sponsorship, and then you get the adverts that they're playing. And so at which point I'm at which point I'm out. At that point, even my love for other podcasters and my patience for it kind of draws a line there. Okay. I'll make an apology to anybody who's listened to the other show I co-host, which is Top of Most of the Pop of Most, because we do occasionally do a one-minute sponsored ad that we dis- that we talk. But, yeah, yeah. That yeah, we paid for, there's but, nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's just my personal view on it was if I'm doing a one-minute sponsorship at the at the start then generally i've charged you more than i get for the adverts in order yeah. to do that because by doing that i will take the adverts off that episode yeah we don't have um, any other adverts in there actually yeah yeah so you carry on do that man but they're always we, we also specifically pick when we do them we make sure that whatever it is that, that is the sponsorship it relates to the subject that the show is about as well because mm-hmm. if you're doing a program about i don't know let's have a thing i don't know you're doing a beatles program and then you you do a, you do a sponsorship for i don't know some sexual aid or something or other that doesn't really work yeah. do you know what i mean yeah there are certain musicians where that would be appropriate but the beatles just not there no absolutely not no, not officially so you've got the show the show has evolved over time and Research and guest, that can be a time-consuming thing. Yeah, and I'm going to sound awfully smug here now, and I'm going to enjoy the smugness of this because, you know what, I've done well earned it. Okay. And that's, you kind of get to a magic point in podcasting. People talk about this, like, mythical 10,000 listeners a, a month, as in that's what you need in order to be able to monetize your podcast and things. Let me just show you out there, listeners. You don't. You can okay. do it on a lot less than less than that. But a curious thing happens when you hit that mark for the first time. Okay. And that's that you start appearing on everybody's API reports that might be interested in that industry. And so it came to a month where I just kind of like peaked because I'd done a load of episodes. Yep. And I'd also had one or two big names with some pretty decent followings who were on board with who were on board with actually sharing it out there so i i had like a a month where in that i did a bonus episode with the head of cold war for the imperial war museum at wow. Duxford, and wow. their media team kind of shared it out and then in the same month i'd got a lovely chap called francis young who was it's like really niche episode that i thought is not going to go anywhere it was like oh medieval paganism didn't go underground in the middle ages and I thought, this is this is niche but i don't want to turn away anybody Yep. And, but that that went everywhere because that boy has a cult following of his own. Okay, and it's like there is about four thousand people following him on Twitter that will listen to anything he says. They will listen to him read the phone book. Wow, lovely people. So that went quite kind of 
stratospheric from there. And the same episode, I also had Peter Caddick Adams, who's an incredibly well respected World War II historian with a very similar following. Yeah. And both of them are open to sharing everything that they've done and being around social media. So I kind of peaked 10,000 lessons in that month and I was absolutely over the moon. And then publishing houses started contacting me mm-hmm. and saying, oh, we've got these authors that have got book launches in, in the next three months. Yeah. Can they come onto your podcast to do it? And I thought, the, yeah, I did when I just, like dived in on the first publisher that contacted me, got about five authors off them. Yeah. Um, not all of whom were that good. In fact, that contained the one episode as well that I've recorded and not published. Just because... Yeah. Just because it was that bad a performer, really was. There was nothing I could do with that episode. I just had to, just had to quit and start again. But once now that the publishing houses have got in, of course, when I've got their author on, they'll share it out on all their social media channels, and you kind of cascade it up from that. So it comes to a point now where I don't actually have to do a great deal of work in getting hold of guests. Okay, probably about sixty percent of my guests will come to me. Wow. And then the other 40, I can go if I want to target somebody with a particularly big name or if I want to do a rage where nobody seems to be biting, but I want to do that episode, so I'll go out and find somebody who can do it. I've got the time to do that now. Yeah. Then following kind of the publishers started to contact me, then I think it was September of last year. And it was literally about two weeks beforehand, I was contacted by the Gloucester History Festival and asked if I would would like to be a podcaster in residence. And what that gave me is I did about seven episodes in the space of a weekend, but it gave me a lot of kind of personal contact details for a lot of really big name historians. So it's now like, okay, I'm thinking I'd quite like to get Tracy Borman on, so I'll just reach out and contact her and and things like that. So I'm I'm now in that position where where I can do that and and you know, like give you an idea of kind of where I'm up to the, with the people I've just got booked in and agreed with recording dates sorted. If I was to record nobody else other than the people that I've got on that list, I'd have an episode a week until the 6th of April next year. Okay. And we are recording now on the 18th of June, by the way. Yeah. And I'm saying that because the chat with you and the chat with the person I've got in the morning, that means that I have episodes to last me until the end of October for the next yeah. for the next four months. Yeah, but this is I like to say this is where you can where you can get going back to my early days. It was I I was looking at am I actually going to get another ten episodes out of this. One historian, I will not name her, but I almost tricked her into coming on to the uh, podcast. And you could tell if you listened to it that she kind of treated me with barely concealed contempt throughout. We have since now got a lot closer. I do get invited to book launches and things like that. But yeah, it's that that's probably my one episode that I regret is that I just, I'm not proud of that one because I just did it in such an underhand way. But relatively big name and i thought i'm going to capitalize on any opportunity i've got to actually talk with you to be fair she could have just turned around and said no i'm not doing it i've had that before so i'm not going to be too guilty about it but it was really a case of following a lot of people on twitter and twitter is that place where people love to go for an argument so if you want to see what pisses somebody off go on twitter and follow them and eventually it'll turn up and I would engage with that and reply to people saying, I've got this podcast. Would you like to rage about that subject? Yeah. And some will say yes, some will say no, but I've got quite a few that were that were willing to say yes. And so that grew. I got another couple of big names for series three. And then from, I would say from probably about series six onwards, it really kind of bedded in because I'd got a healthy number of people who'd been on it and had fun and wanted to come back as well as the publishing company saying, we've got this person that wants wants to sort a book out. The festival's given me the contacts, so that's become a lot easier. But at the start, I knew nobody. I think I knew two people in, in total. Those, two of those people were particularly big names. But I knew, but what we did, and it was, it was something that other podcasting friend of mine, Ian Sanders from Cold War Conversations, so yeah. shout out to Ian. 
brilliant podcast interviews just people who lived through the cold war it's, it's absolutely phenomenal it's huge i dream of having his visitor numbers and listener numbers yes he's just passed his yeah. four millionth download i think he started in 2018 yeah it's terrifying but he said to me that one of the things he did at the start because he was in a very similar position is he knew some cold war people but it was where do you reach out and he said when you've interviewed somebody ask them for three people they know who they yeah. think would enjoy doing this and so I, I started that and started that from about series two onwards and so I got three names and roughly three email addresses out of every episode and I email all those three yeah and you you would invariably get one that would come back and say that sometimes you got two sometimes you got all three or if there was somebody that I went that I wanted on I can look up their website because historians promote themselves they they have to so you just find their find their website find their contact details if you could and I would just send a blind email outlining what the show was about would they be interested in doing it I got Carl Chin that way who's a Birmingham historian that studied the real Peaky Blinders yeah which was he, he came on to raise that the Peaky Blinders are not glamorous organized or Edwardian yes uh, and that's absolutely fascinating episode i think series five episode three that one's like well worth a listen assuming you can get past the accent because his accent is incredible it's like incredibly full-on brummy yeah. ian is actually one of my favorite episodes that i've done chatting with ian i really enjoyed that show with yeah. him that i did I, I such a that. good bloke and and for a, for a podcaster of that size he's never forgotten he was the little guy once no no, not at all. But also his knowledge and and his or and sometimes his thirst for knowledge as well is just so it's it pulls you in. His yeah. his excitement for it and like I said, his search for finding out things is just amazing. Yeah, and the just sheer scope of that podcast where he's covered everybody from the son of Nikita Khrushchev. Yeah commanders of nuclear missile submarines to Romanian schoolgirls trying to evade the secret police to East German border guards is, is just staggering. And then there was that fantastic story he told me about being on Twitter or something and he mentioned something or, or there was a picture in, or something, I can't remember the complete story properly or whatever, but this girl was saying, oh, my father saw that and he was basically, essentially, he was there for this event that happened, I think, in Romania or somewhere that was a big event. And he got, he got, he got, Ian got this chap to come on and his daughter as well with him. And his daughter was saying that, so he was part of this thing that overthrew the government in this Soviet mm -hmm. country, something to do with a radio station or something. And she was saying that it was incredible because he was coming out with stories that she'd never heard from him before because Ian was just able to get these hidden yeah. facts from these people. Okay, once you finish listening to History Rage, guys, everybody out there, give, give Cold War Conversations a whirl because you will find an episode in there that really opens your eyes to something. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say to people that if they listen to your show and, and his... I think that's a nice, almost like putting it in a food to, food food analogy, but probably a bad food analogy. That's a nice sandwich to have. It was a nice yeah. meal together, those two You shows. can do both as well, because Ian has yeah. done a history rage that he feels that the Cold War should be treated like a real war. So yes. he has been on that. Agreed. So recording and editing then. Okay. So again, like I said earlier, I'm a Yorkshireman. Yep. And so if I could do it for free, then I did it for free. What I used to record and edit has, what I used to record has changed quite dramatically over the, since the start, really. Yeah. Started out on Zoom, didn't work out for me. I very much like things to record in two separate tracks. So then, and also I like my things to have not a 40 minute limit on an interview. So I wasn't quite ready to pay like at Zoom levels at that point. So I started out recording on Zencaster. Yep. by Ian's recommendation and hosting with Buzzsprout. Yeah. Um, also at Ian's recommendation and editing with Audacity because it's free. Yes. 
and I like free. Since then, I've evolved a bit. Zencaster had a lot of problems with connectivity as far as I was concerned. Yeah. And so I made the jump at that point to move to Squad. Now, Squadcast has done me absolutely fine. I can't say I've ever had really any problem with them. But there was a thing that I wanted to do for the Patreon subscribers now, which was basically to almost live stream to them so that they can engage in the chat yeah. while I'm doing a book preview with with, with an author. And Squadcast doesn't have that. It will just let you have 10 people in the background. So I switched to Riverside that will let you have up to a thousand people engaging on chat. Wow. Within there while I'm while I'm recording. So that's in that's in terms of recording stuff. I'm very much a newcomer to Riverside, so I've got to spend a month working out how to actually use it at the moment. But certainly they're they're similarly priced. I think it was kind of come something like about twenty dollars a month for Riverside in total. Maybe a little bit above that, but that's because I've raced the game and gone up a level from from where I was on Squadcast. Squadcast was about fifteen dollars, about twelve pound per month. Very useful because it's combined with Descript, so yep. it comes with a lot of auto transcribing and things like that, and it's very good at removing filler words as well. You just run it through that, and it will take a lot of your ums, ahs, and everything like that that are the bane of podcasters' lives. I do have other cheats that, that that get rid of a lot of those, so I didn't need to go down that route. In terms of hosting, like I said, I started out with Buzzsprout. I was paying them about sort of $10, $12 a month. That was giving me five hours of upload, and it was doing all the distributing for me. Yep. But I got to a point where actually I was uploading more stuff than Buzzsprout could host. Yeah. So that's when I switched to Acast and I was at a level then where I could do do the Acast marketplace and get on the get with the adverts as well. I would say if I could if I could get the same deal with Buzzsprout that I got with that I get with Acast, I would go back in a heartbeat. Yeah. I really would. Because Buzzsprout's customer service is phenomenal. Okay. It, it really is. You get in touch with Buzz buzzsprout with an issue whether it be via their facebook group or whether it be via their direct chat or on occasions if you phone them and they will answer it and they will deal with it whereas you yep. do have to push a cast for quite a bit until you actually get get an answer and even then that answer doesn't necessarily make a, a lot of sense so a cast works well when it's working but if you start to have an issue then you've, you've got something you've got your work cut out for you uh, but that's broadly where I've where where I've evolved to in terms of that for the moment. And then it's audacity. It's just learning what all the things on the menu settings do. And I'm not a sound engineer by any stretch of the imagination. I can set my compressor settings to what works, but I don't know why it works. I set it to those settings because that's what various videos recommended that I did. I'm just waiting to get some time to kind of go on some more sort of sound editing courses. But if out there people are like me that are just staring at that waveform and thinking what how orthonic ladies and gentlemen is well worth the money it's about it's about nine pound a month if you want to make that a regular i tend to buy orthonic credits because it just works out cheaper over the course of the year because there are some months where i just don't record anything and you upload and set the set the various parameters of it there's nothing technical involved and it will clean up your audio. It will level your voice levels. It will yep. get rid of echo. It will get rid of the breath noises. It gets rid of the filler words. It, it, it's phenomenal stuff. It really is. So if you've got no idea how to edit, then literally your editing can be listen to your episode and pull out the content that you don't like, export it, upload it as a WAV to Orphonic, let that run its magic, download it, you've got an episode good to go. It is brilliant. I should be on commission for them. I really should. I just recommend them everywhere. Yep. Yep. Are you here? Are you listening? We're going, we're going to tag them, I think. So, favorite topic. That sort of goes one, two with the standout show moments, I'd, I'd say. So, what are the favorite topics or show moments that jump out to you? I'd say probably because so many. Yes, the, especially when you where, when you have fun doing it. Some of the favourite rages that I've had on there been not necessarily my big league historians as well. It's uh, just some that that catch you by surprise. So, for example, I got another podcaster, a good mate of mine called Jem Daduchu. 
yep. who runs the Condensed Histories podcast. And he came on, it was his second rage. And he he came on to, to basically say that pirates are not child friendly. And when he went off into this rant that was like, who, yeah. who looked at these drunken, murderous criminals and thought this is the, the this is perfect for a child for a four year old's birthday party? Yes, yeah. Suggesting yep. that no, people have pirate parties, but no, nobody will let you back if you send your four year old child in a a pair of flip flops, an old football shirt, and an AK forty seven. But they're still pirates. <laughs> And it's, yeah. it's the ones where people go off on one that I particularly like. Peter Caddick Adams, one of the quietest, nicest gentlemen you're ever going to meet. Such yeah. a such a polite, proper, proper gentleman. Uh, but he's just an episode on Montgomery where you could just tell he was being a, just exacerbated after li listening to Montgomery worship for 40 years. Yeah. He just opened up and let it all out. Oh, they has accused us of having trying to kill him though, because he, he does end up in a cardiology unit within three weeks of recording an episode with us. I'm wow. going to say right now that's not our fault. Yep. But I will say I'm recording with him again next week, and I'm I'm, I'm going to seek medical advice before doing so. <laughs> Get an ambulance booked for him just in case. Yeah, and then we've had ones where yeah. What's your swearing rule on here? Jesse can get rid of it. <laughs> so, 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 so if no, if, I won't quote, I won't okay. quote that one then. But it's, it's, it's basically I used to have a swearing rule, where, which was which was don't swear, and then we had Alex Churchill on, and I asked her the rage question, and it just went blue and downhill from there, to the point where if I'd have actually bleeped out all the swearing in that episode, I would have had a Morse code message that spelled out a recipe for a really good soup. And so I ended up ditching the <laughs> just ditching the Thanks. swearing rule from that point, you know. There's only two swear words that, are, that 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 Jesse's come to me with, and I've said, if you can, then yes, do try and smooth over those. And they're they're the two words that I suppose probably the the F word for sure. Mm -hmm. And then then I think the the other word he's come to me with is the the C word as well that's come up. Other than that, yeah. It's, Pretty mild. They're, they're really. the biggies. We had the C yeah. word. Now I will allow it if you are quoting a medieval or Tudor manuscript, which yes. is where they all come up. Yeah. So it uh, has appeared once in uh, an episode that's not out yet, but that was on the reputation of Catherine Howard, which is very good. Again, that historian's one of my standout episodes. He, he's done me two so far. One which was on Anne Boleyn, yeah. and the the idea that. Anne Boleyn is some form of commoner or self-made girl done good. No, really, she's descended from massive Irish nobility and stupefying wealth. Yeah. And I recorded him at a festival special. He really is. Yeah, a chap called Gareth Russell. Uh, it's so witty. It, it is unreal. And then he very kindly came back to, because he's an Irishman, he came back to do me an episode on the Titanic disaster yep. uh, as a special for the anniversary and take on the idea of the, that whole trope that you get in the films about third class being locked below to drown. Yes. Nonsense. Yeah. And so he had a very good movie rant of, uh, at me as well. And it's these it's these episodes where somebody catches you by surprise with just how angry that they get about something. I, I mentioned Helen Fry earlier on. She was, when she came to do a first episode with me, we asked her the question. She just kicked off, started going on about punctuation. Nazis really? shouldn't have an apostrophe in it. <laughs> and I was thinking, this is not grammar, Rage. Mm -hmm. yep. But I'll ride with it. I was going to take it out, but I thought, no, it's so much of a classic Rage. I'm going to leave yeah. that right in there. Yeah. That's that's what makes it fun. And those times when you just get to look at something in a completely different way. We have this like unofficial tagline for the podcast, which is, yep. well, when you look at it like that... You can see, and it's like Alex, Alex Churchill's episode on the idea of lions led by donkeys. She just said, you don't get to direct a level in your chosen career in the most horrific environment that the world has seen so far by being yeah. a complete moron. Yeah. That just yeah. doesn't happen. So when you start to when you start to kind of pick apart and examine these things that you realize that you should have known that all along. And those, those for me are my for are my standouts. So Chris Kempsell did an absolutely phenomenal. I warn you, it is a swear fest. But he did one on the French are not cheese eating surrender monkeys. Yep. 
And he did a beautiful line in that. It says, if France has this reputation that they that they can't fight and they lose all their wars, we should stop celebrating Waterloo and Trafalgar then, wouldn't it? Because they'd be absolute cakewalks. Thinking, yeah. 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 yeah, there was a time we considered the French to be the biggest threat in Europe. You know, well, and it's... Uh, yeah, the, going back to the media side of it again, that makes me think of c- certain films, sort of. I think I've always enjoyed the film Glory which is about essentially it's, it's a troop of black men or black people who were were chosen to be one of the armed forces in the American Civil War, I believe. Mm-hmm. Is that right? I, I think, haven't seen yeah. the film, but I'm aware that that's what it's covering. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it is and it is based on, on, a, on a real regiment as well. Um, yeah. And so I find those sort of things interesting where you go into those areas. So uh, it's like when you see war films that, show the realism that you have people, you know, it, there's a big contingent of black officers or well, not black officers, but black soldiers and people of color in the British armed forces mm. that, that, that backed us up that aren't represented in a lot of war films. And I find a lot of those films that have the representation in there to be more interesting and possibly have closer to realism in there as well in their their depictions yeah yeah you look at i think master and commander does it actually but you'd see that the the royal navy has gotten or it, it's quite even the royal navy of the napoleonic wars is quite a diverse setup because most people in ports where you're recruiting for and things like that you don't have this idea of the, that we have now where everything was kind of decided where if you're around like portsmouth or falmouth or Plymouth and those sorts of areas. You're just intermingling with people day in, day out. You don't really care. Yes, you might have to go to war with them, but you could just as easily be going to war with the Germans or the French yep. who who match you up. And when you've got things like, particularly, say, during the War of 1812, opinion is divided on this. I appreciate that that is controversy. There is one, one part that says the British pressed American, American slaves into service. Well, there's the other side that says, basically, we took over the slave ship and so you could come and work for the navy or we could just leave you on the ship where are you going to go there's no that that debate will go on for centuries but yeah. it does make the the royal navy quite a dive and when you start to examine that you see these different these different patrols for what they are yeah essentially either way with that it's it's, it's it could be seen as a form of blackmail to a degree of, of that hmm. sub- subject specifically y- you can come and work for us and get paid to be in the navy or we'll just leave you on this ship to go over there and become slaves it's sort of like so do we do we stay with these and get paid potentially to die or we do do we go over to this country and die for no money at all it's which one do we choose yeah but, there's an element of we've, yeah. we've taken over the ship we've stopped the slave ship we've yeah. got rid of the crew so you can come and join the navy or you can crew this ship and go your own way. Yeah. But you're looking at you're looking at a group of people there that are thinking, well, I was about to be forced to work for nothing. Here, work's not going to be fun, but it's going to be about the same work as this ship is. Plus, we're probably protected a bit more from somebody re-enslaving us and we'll get paid. There's a lot of wins here. Yeah. But yeah, there is there's 50% blackmail, 50% liberation, and I invite everybody to make their own mind up on that argument. I will I will not come forward with an opinion. And yeah, I mean, I was about to about to say, dare I say that under the circumstances of being in a war situation, you can sort of understand why people were going to these measures to a degree of trying to get manpower in the armed forces, but that's I'm not sure whether I really want to push that argument. Yeah, yeah. So go down that route because that is <laughs> that that is a rage that I'll have coming up. In fact, actually, which is press ganging and rum rum sod me in the lash. There we go. That, that's coming up. So when when you when you you've got ready for the show, you've done the research into the subject and in the guest themselves. Do you then have a have a script or a or a set? guide that you follow does it in, does it include improv or do you try to stick to it's a stupid question really because i know you'll go off on tangents but i'll ask you <laughs> yeah anything. it's 
No, it's a, it's a valid question, actually, because how I've done that has changed over the kind of three years that History of Age has been going. So when I started out, I was very much, I'm go, I've got this format of I will ask people about themselves and I will ask the Rage question and then about six questions. Yeah. Um, tend to try and keep to about five to eight minutes a question if I can, because that gives me an episode that's about the length of a work commute. Yep. which is what I'm aiming for because that's when most of my listener base are listening when they're on the way to work. So I would, I would start with that six questions. So I would be sitting there racking my brains for a number of times. So I'd be coming up with intelligent questions. Fortunately, I received a rather good education. So I can, I, I could come up with that. Now I've streamlined that a bit over the course of kind of the next few episodes and series up to about series three. And then I had a guest on, Matt Bone, probably our most controversial ep- episode ever, when, which is the one that caused the biggest social media backlash when he came on in Series 3 and went, Spitfire, not really that iconic. And, oh, God, the meltdown of that. I had to take the Twitter app off my phone because it was just <laughs> bleeping too many times. Yeah. Uh, but he gave him the piece of advice that said, never be never be scared to interrupt a cust- Never be scared to interrupt a guest. Okay. Okay, never be scared to go off script because if you've thought of a question to ask Paul, your listener base has thought of the same question. And a lot of the time, that's where you can get some of your best content as well. Yes. You get that little bit of extra clarity and something goes in. So there have been occasions where one of the recent episodes that we did on execution and burning at the stake, I actually, I wrote six questions. I only asked two of them. Yeah, because we at that point went off in a different conversation. There have been occasions where I just couldn't get a word in. So I've said somebody off, they've they've just ranted straight for 45 minutes and I could barely got a look in. And then the other thing that started to do as well to make life easier was about one per month, I have a look at the like the biggest name that's in that upcoming season. And then I will put that to the Patreon subscribers and say, send me your questions. Uh, and they usually take care of about three or four of those out of the six. Right. So that if I'm really stuck, really yeah. stuck, because there are occasions that I know nothing about at all and don't even know where to start, then I do, I, I, I will ask AI. And I'll, I'll go on to one of the AI providers and say, I have got this podcast that's covering this subject with this person. Yeah. Please write me 10 intelligent questions I can ask this historian. And then I will pick two that I like the look of. So so when, when you're doing the research, what, what are your favorite research materials or ways to research? A lot of the time I will a lot, a lot of the time we're dealing with usually a book that I've read or I've had a conversation with a historian that's wanting to rage. So so historians are really good at writing essays because they're used to yeah. writing 110,000 word books. So writing 3,000 word email is no problem to an average historian. Yeah. So what you tend to get is when somebody gets in touch with me to say that I want to rage about this because this is the reality. And then you've got quite a long list of where, what the issues are. And they usually spell out the message that they want to get out. So at that point, I don't need to go into graphic details on on the actual subject i tend not to do a lot of research into the into the background of the subject in question because that's their area of expertise and i don't want to sort of railroad them down a particular point i will have a look just to make sure that i'm not making an ass of myself in, in questions and what i will also do is i will look at relevant years so If I've got something like, for example, I had a chap that came on wanted to talk about the Franklin expedition. So what I do is I make sure that I've got notes of the years that that's in place. And that's mostly as a safeguard because people cock things up. I've had a couple of historians that got their dates wrong. It's not that they didn't know their dates. It's just that they said the wrong thing on the microphone. But as a non-historian, I'm not going to know until I release it. And then yeah. people who know better respond to it. Oh, God, so, yes. Yeah, exactly. I, I know that with the music shows that I do. And you, you'll put something in there and you will get a flood of people suddenly telling you that you got that wrong. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, the phrase all historians dread in any form of whether it be media talk or anything is that person that starts their sentence with, I think you'll find... Yes. And so I will make sure I've got as many notes as I can about relevant times, dates, and things like that. Because then if I've got something different, I can at least query it. Yep. Because I'm my source might be wrong. And if they're adamant and sticking to it, then I will trust their judgment on it and go with it. And then if there is a backlash, I could go, at least I asked and know who stuck to this date. But yeah, I one of the reasons I don't do a huge amount of research into the historical topic that I'm coming from is I like to learn. And if I've, if I've got the opportunity to learn from an expert, a lot of my listener base are not historians of the subject that I'm putting out there. A lot of people are history enthusiasts, they're history buffs, they're entry-level history. Sometimes you get people that are looking for alternate things because they're studying. I've had comments from somebody when we did our episode on the suffragettes yeah. and that they World War One didn't get women the vote. Because again, going back to what I said before, when you look at something in a different way, they have this idea that, oh, it was the First World War so that they gave women the vote because of all the work they did in the First World War. But the women who did the work in the First World War still couldn't vote in 1918. That's true. Yeah. And and I got some comments back from there who'd been do, doing the suffragettes as her kind of social history module of her A-level in history. So she like, found this really useful because it gave me a whole load of other things to to look at. And so I... I tend to like to share that experience with my listener. This is a, this is a new thing for me. I will know a little bit about it just on the basis of getting questions together, but but I like to be as coming into this as as cold as I can. Yeah, in some ways, that's that's one of the things I like about listening to podcasts. Is sometimes I'll come across a podcast like when I had completely different subject. When I had Kev Brown on who not only does he do a Queen podcast, I'm certainly going to have him on for that because that's my favourite band, but I had him on for a show that he'd done what he'd done before he'd started that, and he was doing a, a song by song, and he still is, through the career of Tom Petty. And mm -hmm. I sort of knew some of the Tom Petty songs, some of the more famous ones, because we're British, so we get the Travelling Wilbury stuff, the Don't I Won't Back Down and these sort of things. Yeah. And, and I said to him, I said, to him then and I still find it I said the interesting thing is because I'm coming at it from a knowing very little essentially using that really that that quote that that saying that people a lot of people hate when you listen to a show like that every day is a school day mm -hmm. so you learn something different from that and those are the shows sometimes I find those really interesting and riveting because I'm learning something new then, like I did, like I've done with your show, listening yeah. to the, the the Brave Art one, I knew some of that was incorrect, but I didn't know all of the in inaccuracies in there. There's a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, it's about two hours of them, in fact. And then the the Battle of the Bulge episode, I listened to that, and I knew some bits about that, but I didn't know all of the inaccuracies about how that's been depicted as well. Yeah, one of the nice sort of bits of feedback that that I did get was I. I go to a fair few history festivals because I'm demonstrating and other things. And that's where I started to meet quite a few of my listeners because people do people didn't know the face, but they knew the voice. Yeah. So I'd like get to the end of a show and then somebody come up and go, History Rage guys. Yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> but to find that to run in about two or three are like my Patreon subscribers who are absolute one hundred percent World War II nerds. And they will consume anything World War II based. But to find that they'd listened to Georgian and Tudor episodes and still enjoyed those as well was was a real moment of victory for me. That reminds me of what you said earlier on about the bad language, the C word, in if it's in context. Mm -hmm. And my, my other half, she, a lot of historians probably won't like this, but she enjoys the Tudors, the series. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Right. So she enjoys that. And then the first time she watched it, she's watched it three or four times now all the way through. And the first time she watched it, she was saying to me each time, because I'd go out, I'd be out at work, and she'd say the next day she's watched it, and she'd be like, oh, they've said this word. I didn't know that this word was around at that time. Oh, good Lord. It's and, and I was saying Saxon. to her things like, these words that you're hearing, they go even further back than you actually believe they come from. Yeah. Yeah, terrifyingly far back. Yeah, yeah, especially the C and the 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 F word. They go back. Yep. 
a lot. Yeah, well, they they don't call them, they don't call them Saxon for nothing. You know? No, they do not. No, no. So logo and music. Then is there any show music? I don't think there's any show music towards the beginning. I don't know whether you've had any on the mo- more recently or not. I've got an intro and an outro, a little yeah. kind of ditty that. Yeah. So what's the stories behind those then? The logo and logo and that intro and outro. This is, again, this is an exercise in me being being a Yorkshireman and not wanting to pay out any money for anything. So I broadly got onto an excellent website called Pixabay. Yeah, uh, which basically deals with copyright and royalty-free imagery. Made sure that I could use it for commercial use. Basically, I made the I made the logo out of the three parts. So they you you got that kind of background, kind of historic map-looking compass yeah. style form in the main background, and then there was just this like clip art image in there, which was actually a choir boy. Okay, uh, but it was the the image that I've got with the like stick figure chap reading a book and very open mouth looking like he's screaming he's actually singing but he's looking like he's looking enough like he's screaming that i can just right i will take that i will put that on top of there uh and then i just added text over the top and that was my logo and that was broadly all the work that i did on it i was just just assemble that and and go and just kept it ever since so it was really really important with your logo that even if your logo isn't stellar like stick with it. Yep. Don't change it because you are gonna you're gonna put it everywhere. And so so kind of kept on with that. The music again, very similar way. It's like I did start out with some kind of like heavy metal stroke rock track. Oh yeah. Yeah. That I tested out with people and they didn't like it. And so I went for something a little bit more kind of like clappy and scar and not related to anger at all, but just just a nice little tune. And I I have had some comments as well that say if I'm going to do a live show that I need to include that music. Okay, <laughs> it's like oh yeah, that's a win. Yeah, for something that I didn't just like, I I was literally about I'd finished ep- editing the first episode and I thought I need something to go at the start and end of this, just something, anything. But that that sounds nice and is not objectionable, so I'll put that in. And yeah, and it's it's stuck ever since. A huge story behind my logo and music, really. I, would, I wish there were, and I would like to say that I felt this deep connection with something on a on a deeply artistic, spiritual, and educational level. But my music's changed over the years as well, thankfully, because. Yeah, because mine, if you go back to really old episodes of mine, I've got this, it's almost like dance-ish type backing, but me playing really loud, distorted guitar over the top, just noodling for just over a minute at the opening. And I think I, I noticed it's with those things that as you do it, the longer that you do podcasts, the more that you notice things and you think, actually, they do it this way. Mm. And they do it this way. They do it this way. They have this short intro. Perhaps I'm doing it wrong. And yeah. if I made the intro a bit short, if I made the intro a lot shorter and people will into the show quicker, maybe that might work better. And yeah. And also make I'm it more. I'm a big believer in yeah. no more than 15 seconds of intro music. But also um, if it's not really loud and noisy as well, and it's sort of like laid back, comfortable, people know what they're expecting in, in essence and it sort of eases them in rather than being hyped up and then the intro is a bit of the show's a bit sort of like where it starts and it hypes up as the show goes on it's like bringing people up bring them back down bring them up yeah and whatever so the beauty of a conversational podcast that's not storytelling of course is that you don't have to put any music in the middle of it you you listen to some of the either true history or true prog- true crime podcasts where they're You've got you've got a solo podcaster that's talking and telling a story. Now they've got a much bigger headache in trying to create atmosphere and yeah. stuff, which music is a very big part of. I I've got just historian swearing. You do not need musical backup for that. No, that's its own music. They 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 essentially because that is the different. They're doing the verse, the chorus, and the bridge in the way yeah. that they they change the way that they speak according to how, as we've said a couple of times, how pissed off they are about yeah yeah and their rage is music to my ears 
So what advice would you give to people if they were starting their own podcast? Oh, there's several. What I would say is, as we've mentioned before, you can go back to episode one and that's that's like the worst sound editing that, that I've ever done. And you can have the greatest content in the world, but yep. really bad, bad sound quality will kill your podcast. Absolutely. I've got, I, I've listened to a few that sort of guests of mine have launched and their, their content is brilliant. Their content is exactly the sort of thing that I like to read, yep. but there have been occasions where I just can't bear to listen to it. And they, these are people who've published audio books. These people should be like, because if you don't care about your sound quality, then you can't expect anybody to care about your podcast. Your yeah. sound quality is your listener's experience. If you are winding your listeners up, they're not going to come back. People say that podcasting is a saturated market. It isn't. But there's about 4 million podcasts out there plus. Yeah. If they don't like yours, they'll find another. And so sound, you know, learn to sound at a basic level. If you can't do that, fork out for Orphonic and it'll... It, it will do the bulk of it for you. But that that is really important. And the second greatest piece of advice that I ever overheard was, I think this actually came from Dan Jones, and it applies to books, but it equally applies to podcasts. And he said, you can't edit what you haven't written. And so you get people that are out there and they're thinking, oh, I'll do a podcast. I'm thinking about doing a podcast. I could do a podcast on this and then just do it. Yep. Just even if you do nothing else other than <clears throat> open up Audacity, click record and start recording it, do it. Because once you do that and you play it back to you, you'll highlight to you everything that's wrong with it. Yep. And then what you do is you take that and go, okay, now I know I've got that problem. I'm going to look and correct it. History of Rage is actually the fourth podcast we tried. Okay. Before we actually went out and went out and launched. We tried doing one that was just about sort of 10 minute history bites. That became just too much of an issue to write. And I was running out of time. So at that point, I thought, okay, I need to do something shorter. So next one we tried, we tried a podcast called The Letter of the Law, The Age Set of Crime. Uh, and that was, we would, each week we would select a random letter. And then each of us had to come back with two stories that were linked to that, linked to that letter. So, you know, you may have drawn G and I'm going to come back and talk about the London garrotting panic of 1860 yep. and the trial of uh, the trial of manhunt for Daniel Good, which actually introduced plainclothes police officers okay. and, and that sort of thing. But again, it meant that each week we were going away and doing more research and and things like that. And but the key thing is, is we tried it and we recorded it and we realized that we didn't like it and we realized why we didn't like it. And then we understood that that wasn't something we could correct. So that project had to go and we needed to do something different. And, and from that history rage evolved out of that because then that became something that we recognized that we didn't have to do a lot of the research yep. and we weren't going to be doing a lot of the talking. So we didn't need to do a load of the sort of script writing beforehand we can let we can let the historian do the talking and promote their own book and i suppose a bit of advice number three is it's a marathon not a sprint yep. okay there's there's a couple of unwritten rules in podcasting which is it takes you two years to get taken seriously people will have a look on adult at apple podcasts and if you've got something that's episodic rather than kind of serial if you've got a serial one, people may expect that there's like there's eight episodes of it and then it stops. But if they look at an episodic podcast and they see that there's 12 episodes of it and the last episode was posted two years ago, they'll move on. Yeah. They'll yeah. want to build a relationship with a podcast, particularly an episodic one. Yeah. So consistency is key. Basically, you keep producing week upon week upon week upon week. And then... Kind of at two years, that's that's almost an optimum at that point where people go, I've got a decent stretch to be going on here. Yeah. But also then your back catalog is your key to success. So you will get those people that go, and I get them now where they, they go, I've I've liked that. I'll set it to download the rest of them. And suddenly my download spikes go nicely up because somebody's decided to download a hundred episodes in one go, which does wonders for your figures. I'm now oscillating around about 13,000 listens a month. And probably 60% of those are not episodes that I recorded that month and released that month. Yeah. 
So, so back catalog is key. And just because you're getting, or it looks like you're getting nowhere at the start, you've got to build that back catalog. Yeah. First of all, I didn't, it's, I was just looking at, cause I'm a, I'm a stat nerd. I really am. Yeah. Just looking at the sort of week one performance the that i did i had been going really it was episode 39 where it really went up for me yeah and kind of carried on from there but but yeah it's like episode 39 that that was nine months of solid just beating my head against a brick wall yeah until it's done until it started to go up from there and so it's always learn always spring clean your collection I said before that go back to episode one there are sound issues with episode one when i find the time to do so i will re-edit episode one and i will put it back up with better sound quality okay it's an important thing to do but if you like i said before it's not a hobby it's a lifestyle choice it is a job that you pay for and you need to treat it as such there's a similarity in some ways between what i do with this show and what you do with yours which is that it's episodic, so you're talking about a different subject each time, essentially. But because you've got that that back catalogue, essentially, or, or that, that's there, it's interesting because then if you get somebody who's looking for a show and they're specifically interested in a certain subject, because you've got that back catalogue that's there, like I have, let's say, I've in, I think I've had three or four Star Trek-related shows on, for instance, over the... Mm over the nearly four years that I've been going. And so if somebody's interested in Star Trek and they want a show that's about that, they could listen to any of those three or four episodes that are about that to see which one grabs their attention the most and then gravitate to that in their own listening. Yeah. But at the same time, if they've, they've listened to all these shows and they think, actually, I quite like the quality of this show, I'll listen to something else that interests me, maybe not so much, and see what I can get out of that episode based on that. And then the same as yours, then in that case, people might be interested in a certain subject or certain group of subjects that you've mentioned in your show over its history. Yeah. Gravitate towards those episodes and cherry pick out of those, which is the good thing about, a show that is different each episode to episode, they can do that, they could cherry pick. And then the hope there is that they will like the quality so much of those that they'll think, oh, I'll go back and I'll listen to this that I wasn't originally interested in, but you've pulled them in mm -hmm. essentially with the quality of those every episodes that they've cherry picked initially. Yeah, I would say as well to, to the people out there are thinking as well where they've got their subject is niche. Yep. It's not going to have a huge listener base. They're thinking, should I go along with this? It's like never be, never underestimate the power of niche. Yeah. Okay. You take something, you take something like We Have Ways, just looks at the just looks at the Second World War in detail. That is absolutely staggeringly popular yep. podcast that's covering some very specific things. But I'm part of a kind of podcasters, almost like we call it the podcasters support group, really. Yeah. called the Mike's Podcast Club. So shout out to them. They meet up on Zoom once a month and they share experiences and hints, tips, Q&As, ask questions and, and things like that. Now, like I said, I'm I'm at a, I'm at a level of about 13,000, which according to Listen Notes puts me at about top 2.5% in the world. Yeah. There is a lady on there with a podcast about the game of bridge, the card game of bridge. She's yeah. got nowhere near my listener base. She makes three times the money I do because she got an she she got a sponsorship deal that was targeting her niche audience. Yeah. So so never be afraid because with niche versus like my history rage is broad church. You're yep. interested in history, but it could be Tudor, it could be Roman, it could be like pe people tend to have their preferred periods. Yep. Very few people will listen to everything that a history podcast, a general history podcast, puts out. However, your niche audience, you mentioned the Star Trek. you got a Star Trek podcast. Those people will listen to all of that. Yeah. And they will keep coming back for new things about that subject all the time. Yeah. And it, it's the same with this lady and, and her podcast about Bridge. I've not listened to it because yeah. just 
that card game terrifies me. But but she is going to have an audience that is that is not going to leave. And if you've got your if you've got your niche podcast idea, your audience will not leave either. I need a link to that bridge bridge podcast, by the way, if you can give it to me. Um, uh, it be- might take me a couple of days, but yeah. <laughs> Mainly because when I was younger, my mum, I had to, I learned to play bridge because my mum always used to have me as a second, as they call it, the one who was across the mm-hmm. table from her when I was a child. So I had to learn it to play back then. So it's fascinating. But the niche thing, there's another podcast I've listened to and I'm, I'm going to have a chat with Pete, hopefully sometime in the future. He does a show about portable, port- essentially, portable toilet systems, sanitary systems, and it's called Get Flushed. Now that's niche. Now that's niche. But he he, he does have sponsorship yeah. for that as well, because it is niche. But as I've said on my show before to people, niche works because podcast is international. Whereas when, you, when you're looking at a radio company that wants a radio show that's for a specific area and region, they're looking at numbers because of the fact that they're in this area, this region. Whereas if you think about it, with, with, with a podcast, you're international. So you've got the whole of the international. So there might be, there might, yeah, there might in your region only be a certain amount of people interested, but the whole world that amount of people might be thousands of people in the world, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's absolutely so- right. as things currently stand, history rage alone is listened to in 126 countries. Wow. I mostly cover UK and US history, occasional little bit of like European touch of French. I've got regular listeners in Vietnam. That's I hope good. to have more when I do my episode on the Vietnam war. Now, there's a subject and a half to rage yeah. about. Yeah. Inaccuracies in, in, in films about it, for instance. Well, I've got so, an episode coming up that is just, it's all about it's all about how the Vietnam War is perceived versus what it's the actual reality of the Vietnam War is, because yeah. because the two are very, very different. Yeah. There's some things that, that the Vietnamese are accused of that wasn't as prevalent or prevalent as it's said to be. Yeah, and likewise, the things that the Americans are accused of, they're just not as prevalent or done quite an accurate in the way that they're portrayed. For example, you take a look at the... You take a look at that iconic photograph of the girl running away from the napalm attack. You know the one that I mean. Yeah. And it's always pointing at America as being this is how it was. It was actually a South Vietnamese plane that drew, dropped that napalm. Yeah. Do you know what, what you were seeing there was not an American atrocity, but it's often painted as an American atrocity. And it's equally on the equally on the other side. They you you get these you, you get these images of what the NBA are doing to people, which is really only a minority of the VC that are actually carrying out that sorts of things and most of the people that are carrying out those sorts of atrocities against their own Vietnamese people are so hardline that even the Viet Cong get rid of them. They're operating independently. So there's a lot of kind of not just kind of pop culture and media references around them. There's just a whole perception about the Vietnam War that isn't actually that simple. And that's that's the point that he's, he's wanted to get across. And about three months away, that episode will be. Shades of grey. Yeah. yeah. So where can people find you and get old of you then, Paul? Okay, so anywhere that you found pods like us, you can find History Rage. Just search for History Rage. We will be there. We can be found at historyrage.com is the main website. Yep. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Blue Sky, and Instagram at History Rage, or you can see us at the Gloucester History Festival, the Chalk Valley History Festival, and this October, I'll be speaking at the Imperial War Museum Podcast Festival as well. And fingers crossed, might see me at a British Podcast Awards ceremony. Who knows? I tried. You can you can find Pods Like Us on any streaming platform, like, like we've just said, and we are on Patreon, Twitter, or X as you want people want to call it, Facebook, Instagram, talk and threads. 
and you can contact us through podslikeus at gmail.com. Thanks for speaking with me today, Paul. You are welcome. It has been a privilege and an honour. And thank you, everyone, for listening, and hope you listen again to another episode of Pods Like Us. Thank you.